Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, James Farrell. So, James is a master student and also graduate associate, right? Mm -hmm. Um, today he's going to talk about his recent work on evaluating impact of velocity wider systems on autonomous of passenger vehicles. So, James, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. And yes, my name is James Gerald, and I will be presenting this topic. But I want to get, I want to give you guys a little bit of context before I begin. So, in our work, we all have lived in in Columbus, and we've seen like how the city has grown. Um, with this increased population, there's going to be increased traffic. So, because of that, because of more traffic, there's going to be more increased energy consumption, which is going to give us environmental concerns. Um, now, there's many existing existing solutions when it comes to sustainability. Um, one of the first, one or like one of the examples that come to mind is idle stop technology. So, where drivers where you can make stop um, the engine will shut off um, another one being hybrid vehicles so downsizing the engine leading to less emissions into the air um, what my research or what my, what my team goes into is the active safety features so the automotive industry has had a heavy focus on active safety but we're looking into those that technology to see the potential in improving energy efficiency. So what we do is we're going to leverage the ADAS system. So that's just the system drive. So the features you see, such as adaptive cruise control, um, lane keeping, these are the these are the technologies that help drivers and promote safe driving. We want to use that same technology to promote eco driving. So. There's been many studies that have highlighted some of the positive impacts of this technology. Um, but in our for our study, we like to we are aiming to investigate the speed advisory, the, the one of the features, the speed advisory system on both driver behavior and vehicle consumption. So I have here I have a map of how our project is laid out. So we have the initial step, the route generation. Uh, the second step, which is our human subject study, and then our third step, which is our data analysis, which this is where we calculate the consumption and excuse. <laughs> so here I have this is our initial route in Columbus. We have we start here in like the residential area and then we head up into the highway. Um, here on the right side, you can see that this is the simulation or what drivers or what participants will see. You can see that that's on the top left side, like that's the highway, and then you can see more of like the, the intersections, like the urban, the urban route, the urban areas. Next, I want to go into the driver simulator, so the actual cockpit. This is where the participants will be. Um, you can see here the three. The three screen display, that's where the simulation, that's where the simulation environment, that's where people will see it. Um, you have the steering, you have the cockpit, you have the pedals, the steering wheel, and then you have this platform beneath the driver, which is, which will simulate the vehicle motion. So here we have this, the real-time speed advisory system. So this is where um, this is where you'll see the current velocity, current velocity speed. Participants will be able to see in the current, their current velocity and then compare that with the optimal speed. So it's color coded. So if you're below the optimal speed, it'll tell you to speed up. If you're above the optimal speed, it'll tell you to slow down. Um, this optimal speed, I'll go more in detail on how it's calculated, but um, you can see right here, um, um, the, you can see right here that this, the, the tick mark in this pedometer, that shows you the difference between the actual speed and then the optimal speed. 
participants will this is how it'll be set up. You have the on the on the top shows you like the, the view of the speed advisor when it's off, and then you have the speed advisor when it's on. So this is how this is how the advisory this is how the optimal speed is calculated. So a couple of conditions I wanted to to share. The advisory speed was generated offline, and we assume that all the traffic lights in our study is green, just to keep everything simple. And the, our objective, the main thing that I want to point out, the main thing I want to point out is this variable right here. This is our trade-off. This is the trade-off between the fuel consumption and trap time. So here, this is what we're trying to minimize is that, that trade-off over a given amount of steps. Now that we have our initial setup, we can go into our human subject study, where we have two phases. The first phase is the training phase for people to get familiar with the simulator and get familiar with the speed advisory system. And the second stage is the actual data collection. So after people are able to familiarize with themselves, they are going through the route that I mentioned before, and then we're taking the velocity trajectories. Now that we've gone through the initial step and we have the human study, and we've done our human study, we can go into the data analysis and really understand what do we what do we see by getting all of these velocity profiles. So the next phase being our energy evaluation tool, the speed, the speed trajectory or like our velocity, our velocity profiles that we get from our participants that goes into this, this speed tracking tool, which is supposed to represent the conventional driver. So here we have two, we have two parts. So this would be our conventional driver. This would be our actual vehicle, our hybrid vehicle. It's worth noting that when our participants were in the driving simulator, they were driving a Chrysler. So, and that's a hybrid. So we have our conventional driver. This this conventional driver gives us a torque request, which then outputs what we really want based on our our, our equivalent fuel consumption. Now that we have now now that we have this data and we have also our energy consumption calculations. We now we can create metrics to really understand what does this data tell us. So first first metric is the root mean square error. And this shows you how far was the participant from a, a given speed reference, their current speed compared to this given optimal speed, this the speed limit or the optimal speed if the advisor was on. So here on the left, we see that this is our, the error, the speed tracking error, um, the speed tracking error given like speed, a speed limit. This is a speed tracking error given the optimal speed. And what's powerful about this is the tracking error is decreased in this. And that shows us that we can have a more uniform or more predictable speed trajectory when when the speed advisory is on. So with that, driver driver behavior can influence energy consumption. And having this opportunity to you know have predictable have a predictable trajectory can influence fuel. So now, after the driver behavior assessment, we have the, we can go into the energy side. So now we have a metric which quantifies the impact that real-time speed advisory systems have on vehicle energy consumption. So you see here we have the main thing that I want to point out is both driver 15 and driver 26. So this metric compares free driving, the fuel consumed during free driving with the fuel consumed when the speed advisory was on. And so for driver 15, driver 26, huge difference in energy efficiency. Now why is that? Well, driver 15, 
when when doing free when they were during during free driving, they were more of considered an aggressive driver. So in the next slide, I actually go through that. So you can clearly see in drive driver 15 was consistently above the speed limits and the optimal speed when when using the speed advisors. When when the speed advisor is on. Well, this you can see here that this, the fuel consumed was much greater compared to the speed advisor when it was on, which shows, which after our metric shows that they gained so much from having the speed advisor on. Well, it's the opposite case when looking at driver 26. Driver 26, the velocity was they were they were at the speed limit. But this during right here, 4,000 mark um, starts to diverge, and they actually saved more during pre driving than they did having the speed advisor on. And that shows, well, that it's, a quite, it's quite the opposite because they were consistently at either at the speed limit or below. With our, with our problem, our optimization problem that I mentioned before, um, we were minimizing the trade-off between the travel time and the energy energy consumption. So the that problem, or given that that was that was offline, our speed might be greater. Our speed our speed might be greater because we were trying to minimize both the, the travel time and the and the fuel consumption. When driver 26 might be just might just want to doesn't care about travel time. They might not care about travel time. So that's why you can see like maybe the, the, this this discrepancy. Um, the main thing that I wanted to point out is that this that many drivers showed a, an improvement overall in energy efficiency, demonstrating this this potential in using it to lower energy efficiency. Um, I'd just like to conclude that our study provides an analysis on the effects of, of, of how a vehicle advisory system um, affects both driver behavior and vehicle fuel consumption. And it demonstrated that there's a significant potential for using it for energy for energy savings. Um, our future work includes in, integrating basically adding more fidelity to, to our study. So we first off, we assumed that all of the traffic lights were green. So that's not feasible. So given, given this system, giving the system more information to account for traffic lights to better, you know, better change and adapt the optimal speed as we're, as we're traveling through the months so or as we're traveling through the um, the next, the, the, the next thing is this is online speed advisory generation. Ours, our calculations were calculated offline, so we kind of knew how the route was going to play out. In order to to apply this or implement this in the real world, we would like to make those do those calculations online, so it's a little bit more exact. Have more real time speed estimates. So, um, I drive a Prius mm -hmm. with the same like hybrid drivetrain as the Pacifica. For my car, since it's a little bit older, it does have cruise control, but it doesn't have like the adaptive one. So, my friend has a 2020 Honda Civic. This car has like the, you can set how far away you want your fare to be from other cars, sort of cruise control. So for me, I am the person that has to break if I'm getting close to someone's car, the car cannot do it for me. Um, but in my example that I'm thinking of here, I used to live in Virginia and the roads there are very hilly and windy and that kind of thing. And sometimes it is more 
um, fuel efficient to go over the speed limit and when you're going downhill and speed up and then slow down when you get to the bottom rather than trying to keep to the speed limit. Have you thought about implementing any sort of like more um, terrain kind of Absolutely. technology? Um, train. The, I wouldn't say terrain technology, but like, you know, adapting or trying out different routes or different, as you mentioned, what you mentioned is great. So the the elevation or how much how much um, the terrain or the route changes um, that is calculated through how do I want to, I want to, how do I want to say that is calculated through this the the road load equation mm -hmm. so that's like where you actually calculate the course and then you have your um, and then you're given a, a specific um, torque because of, because of that. So I would say that would go into. I think that I, I would say that was uh, that would already be implemented. Like those are some of the things that are kind of considered. Like the when when if I can go back to my. Well, just because looking at the like right turn left turn sort of thing, I'm imagining you already kind of have some sort of angular consideration there. I just was like wondering in the sense of um, for people who might live in areas like that and their car is not meant for more flatter, I guess like urban roads, what would it look like for them on the on maybe like their their cars control that sort of thing? Like how would you go about like testing that I guess is sort of what I wanted to ask. Oh just like how would I go about testing it? Yeah or like adding it to your your uh, your test system. Mm -hmm. So the way that we would go about it is kind of simulating simulating that environment. So like my team would create and would create a simulation that has more hills or that's more like more hilly than other areas and then those and then that would obviously affect the velocity at which like some of the drivers would like how how would they initially drive? So then we would have to so I think that that would, um, I guess that's a whole another question that we can kind of get, in, get into. So. Yes. Okay. so I have two questions. One is a clarifying question. Okay. Is there a hard constraint that the advisor cannot exceed the speed limit? Is that like when you're setting up your advisory profile, is that a hard constraint or is that just what ended up happening? Um, is it, I, I see what you mean. Is it a hard constraint when when setting up the when the speed advisory is on, mm -hmm. right? Um, that would be. I would I would say it's when setting the the velocity. I'd, I I think that was a I'd say a hard constraint. Just um, because the maximum the maximum speed would be like the speed. Okay. You no, know, we still want to abide by the by, by the traffic laws. So having that, just considering that 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 should be. Okay. And then my other question was more philosophical. But why do you think people were more likely to obey the speed limit if they were just being told their delta from it rather than just being told it? Like, why was the speed advisory effective in changing people's behavior? Oh, well, why was it effective in? Yeah. I would say, I guess in this sense, because we told them, we, we told them to, like in the, in the real world, we think people would just have like this as a, many, many people would just, just merely take it as a recommendation. So I guess what would make it effective is, I believe giving more like the, the driver like an incentive. Um, I, I'd have to look to see what, why is it? Because there's there's positive impacts, but the driver still has a has the possibility of merely taking it as recommendation. So there would be more. I think we'd have to do more study as to providing how does it how does a shared control system 
work or how do we get more um, how do we give more incentive to the driver so that we can achieve more Yes. Yeah, so in your like simulator thing, then yeah. the speed advisor is kind of centered in the middle of the screen, more or less. Um, if you're implementing this in a real car, do you think it would have to be out of the view of the driver, more or so on the dash? Yeah. And then, like, obviously, there's a bit of a safety concern with that. And because of that, um, do you see potential for this to be implemented in more of an automatic way so that the driver could, like, set like their speed advisor to be on and the car would, like, follow that speed and they could, like, switch out of it by either the brake or the gas? I see what you mean. Um, so the way that I envision it, I would, you would see like with more, with more modern speedometers that it just shows you the, the current velocity. Um, the way that I would see it is that this, the speed advisor, even though like it was in the middle of the, like it was in the middle of the simulation, that would be located in the, in the dashboard right under the current velocity. So like you can see like this is the velocity that you should be following and then this is your current velocity. And there you can you, from there you have a recommendation. You can, you can follow it if you if you'd like. Um, depending on like say that you were using like the adaptive cruise control, from there that would that system would just cons automatically con consider that velocity. The optimal, the optimal velocity to not only satisfy um, how far it wants to be. So, it, I guess I would say that it just depends on the situation. But I would, the way that I would envision it is, it would be, it would be under the dashboard, just or under like the current velocity when it shows you the current velocity. Um, yeah. Um, do you think people would be able to follow that recommendation as well if it was out of the field of view, though? If it was out of the view? Yeah, because I feel like when I'm driving my car, I only glance down at my speed, you know, once every, oh, every, every once, I see every once in a while. Um So you're saying like how like how effective? Like do you really think that people Yeah, I mean I guess do you think you would expect a little bit of a drop off and I would expect a little bit of a drop off. Okay. I'd say. But I would say overall, if even if you are glancing at it, just just at a, um, even if you are glancing at it, like say you were on the highway, there's not much change when it comes to, you know, if you're glancing and it's just giving you this recommendation, it's staying constant, you know? So even if you are glancing at it, is it really changing as much? Not much. Um, if it's, if you're in a residential area, that's a little different. Um, but I would, but to, to your question, I still would see a little bit of a drop off probably in those areas, in residential areas, more, more so than the highway, highway routes. There's no other questions. Is there any questions? In the I haven't seen any chat yet. So. Oh, oh, you're checking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no other question yet. Let's give a big round of applause to James.